Um, you know, I was thinking about what I wanted to name this, and um, I sort of, I, I took this approach of, you know, being a quite literal, right, uh, this sort of concept of forgetting what you have been uh, told, and of course, change that a little bit, and um, this idea of soul, right? Um, we live in an incredibly um, uh, capitalist nation, and, and in, a, in a very uh, interesting time, um, and uh, the one thing about capitalism that I, I think is perhaps the, the one that we all know and perhaps don't say enough is that uh, capitalism makes products out of everything and everyone, right? Um, and has. And so when I think about education, I think about it as a point of sale as well. And uh, as a quick admissions coordinator, I think about it very seriously um, as that, um, which uh, I think is not necessarily um, the most, let's say, beautiful way of thinking about it. Um, and then, of course, I want to talk a little bit about these sort of nine points that I've uh, generated um, around very loose ideas that I've encountered for this. This is the first time I'm giving this lecture, and um, a lot of what's been going on for me for the last few weeks working on this, in particular the last three days working on this, um, is really the beginning of a book project. Um, that I am going to be starting in earnest in the next few weeks that is based on the altar and specifically based on, uh, again, not just a counter narrative, but really a sort of counter discipline um, to uh, this kind of like capitalist discipline of architecture. And that's why I embrace the term anti fascist, um, which is in the United States at least a kind of a bad word. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I know why it is, but. I, I disagree on why it is. So um, yeah, let's jump into it. So the first thing uh, I'd like to say is that even the lecture title for me is, uh, again, my sort of approach of being influenced by all the cultures that I am a part of. And um, I have been uh, involved in, uh, in punk and, and, and hardcore and, and, and the sort of DIY movement in the United States for over 20 years. Um, and I've been influenced by a number of bands uh, from all over the world, um, and uh, one of them that maybe you you you, you may not know uh, is a very very important band in the world is a band called uh, Chumbawamba, um, which you maybe have heard a thousand times uh, in your life. Uh, at least they're like sort of popular song. But um, what's interesting to me about this this is a 1986 album of theirs um, that's really critiquing the kind of uh, charity driven like. Um, rock concerts and rock stars of the 80s, um, effectively, you know, sort of making everything around this concept of charity, perhaps not critiquing necessarily the sort of larger issues of, of, of capitalism and, and globalization in the global south. Um, and uh, they made this incredible album called The Pictures of Starving Children Sell Records. It's an incredible, incredible album. I would recommend anyone to uh, listen to it, but I got you. If you are interested in um, the playlist that has been going on in my head for probably like the last 20 years and specifically over the last 10 years doing a lot of this work. Um, this is, uh, this is it. Um, it's got a lot of songs, uh, the stuff that you heard as, as you're walking in um, is some of that. Let me move this out of the way because I, I don't know if that's gonna uh, impede that, but um, yeah, uh, I, please share it. Um, I, if, and it's got everything. It's a lot of stuff on it uh, from a lot of different genres. Um, but uh, music is a big way to kind of understand us and people. So um, this is me being kind of on full display um, for y'all in that way. So um, I, I, I think um, some of the, the sort of important things here um, is to uh, understand you know, let, let's say what it is that we're trying to do when we say, um, what is an anti-fascist architecture, right? Um, and one of the simplest way that we sort of started that uh, is by doing this exercise. Oh, sorry, this one. But um, uh, before that exercise, let me, uh, I, I had a joke coming up and I totally messed it up. But um, this is a, a really fantastic quote uh, by Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, and this is uh, me thanking the University of Illinois for giving me a microphone um, on this hand. Um, so which one of these buildings do you all recognize? Have you seen any of these buildings before? 
A lot of people on the left, you've seen that one, right? The right, or maybe not. You know, I mean, if you've seen the altar, you've seen the one on the right, but um, yeah. So basically, um, the one on the left is Casa del Fascio by Giuseppe Terragni. The one on the right is the Agostinian Neto Mausoleum. Um, and uh, it's a little frightening that, um, uh, you know, the better part of uh, the last 50 years in architecture, um, there's been a sort of normalization of the depoliticization of a project like Casa del Fascio um, by, you know, uh, not just folks like Peter Eisen, but really this, this, this whole sort of crowd that has been interested, let's say, in formalism without politics, right? Um, whereas something like the Agostinian Neto Mausoleum is uh, a, 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 a sort of beautiful project, right? That that is, you know, giant in scale. That is formalist in nature. That's um, a, a has its own sort of aesthetic um, understanding, and it's a monument to the liberation of Angola, right? Um, that was an internationalist struggle that um, brought together. Um, you know, several countries to sort of fight against uh, colonialism in Angola, um, and even you know, uh, Cuba was a part of that um, of that struggle. Um, and so, you know, it's a simple question like, why don't we know that versus that, right? So the other one, of course, is which have you been assigned in school? You know, um, I mean, I hope you've been assigned pedagogy of the oppressed, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, you know, surmise that perhaps you've been assigned a Heidegger reading here and there. Um, uh, it's perhaps something around phenomenology, right? Um, and again, you know, it's just, it's tough, right? When you like understand the sort of history of Martin Heidegger being um, at least for a, a, a long while, uh, uh, not just a supporter of, 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 uh, of, of sort of uh, Hitler's fascism, but specifically kind of intellectualizing for, for a long time. And, um, you know, in terms of the discipline of architecture, um, them asking us to, again, to suspend the kind of disbelief that we would have to read a fascist, right? Uh, or, you know, or maybe a disciplined fascist, or maybe someone that repents, right? If you buy into the, you know, sort of Hannah Arendt's um, uh, 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 sort of, um, uh, 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 rescue, right, of, of, of Heidegger um, versus, you know, someone on the left like um, Paulo Freire and the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, you know. I mean, I, I obviously pick two very different kind of aesthetic points, but if someone would like to draw me as an old man uh, gardening and drawing and, you know, with the fist up, I mean, that'd be fantastic. Now, I'm making a lot of, like, value judgments here, but, um, you know, one's a fascist, one's not. Um, so, uh, when I think about, again, you know, we're, we're kind of, this is the prologue to the actual point, so I um, apologize uh, for the speed, perhaps, of this stuff. When I think about um, architecture in general, and I am not really loving this thing here. Um, let me see if I can just, okay, maybe I can get that off. If we can get that off, that would be great. Um, so, a couple of years ago, um, one of, uh, Joseph and I's closest colleagues, who we are in like a sort of, I would say like a polyamorous academic relationship with, like we each write with each other's partner um, in this, Julia Sedlock, thank you. Um, we, uh, we sort of sat down and dealt with our own um, kind of history with the projective project uh, in architecture. Um, and uh, a lot of this, uh, I wouldn't say it's on the, let's say the forefront of architectural education today, but a lot of it's kind of insidious and in the background, right? Um, and so what we tried to do was sort of rebrand this, uh, th these kind of categories, right? Um, in this field. And so what we saw were, uh, let's say a, a couple of practices and a couple of qualities, right? And these practices are on an axis. On the left, you have, this kind of approach to conform to the, the things that are, are happening or to reform the things that are happening, not completely abolish them, just reform them, right? And on the right, you have uh, the sort of activist and the abolitionist project, which is, you know, we really need something completely different and we don't need any of the kind of roots of the thing that was there before. 
On the top, you have this idea of performance, right? And this is for me very architectural, right? Like performance is something that we use in terms of thinking about program as well as thinking about building technology, right? Um, and then with form, perhaps one of the most misunderstood words in architecture, um, you know, it's another kind of approach. And so those are like, again, two different poles. And the combination of each of them, I think, speak very seriously to like what's, what's happening in architecture. So when we think about like the, the, the critical architecture um, that was emerging, you know, in, in, in like the, the, the sort of um, the 70s uh, and then the 80s specifically, um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of thinking and then and now it's still happening. You know, we think about this autonomy from the world around us for the sake of architecture. It's this idea that architecture needs to be separate from the world and it's going to be better for the world because the world doesn't know what it needs, right? Um, at least architecture. Um, and for me, it's, a, it's, it's very much a, it's kind of a form of, uh, of conforming. So we call it conformalism. Um, you have this other uh, sort of approach, which is one that I was incredibly schooled in. Um, which is the projective uh, school, which suggests that you can reform architecture from and within the world around you. But in and of itself, um, there is a kind of skepticism uh, into getting into like different plates, right? Um, and, 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 and trying to really kind of like create something new. That's why I think it's very performative, right? I think that performative reformism is basically the modus operandi of US politics today, right? We're given these sort of like hollow, not just um, uh, um, sort of terms, but really like policies, right? So they're very performative in nature. Um, then you have um, this other kind of uh, approach, right? Which is the, the, and this is probably a little bit better to what I just said, the kind of performative activism, which I call effective. It's actually quite effective in, in, in real life, um, which is performing or co-opting a political message either within or outside the world around you. And, and here we have, you know, a couple of different projects um, that sort of approach um, that. And, and uh, they're just supposed to make you think. They're not necessarily guilty as charged, but you know, I'm judge, jury, and executioner today. Um, in terms of what I think to be really powerful is this idea of formal activism or you know, um, quote unquote objective, right? Again, it's, it's very much uh, double entendres, right? We're, we're, we're not literally meaning we're objective. We just, we love objects. So it's, for me, it's engaging in a kind of revolutionary politics that remake the world through social and aesthetic means. Um, and on this uh, slide, uh, we have uh, Jermaine Barnes, who will be here uh, next week um, as well, who is uh, a fantastic, uh, fantastic architect and a graduate of UIUC. Um, so we finally got to the points. Um, the reason that I think the prologue is important is to kind of give this kind of educational background into a lot of these um, into a lot of these kind of like current architectural issues that I think are, 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 are always being discussed in different ways. Um, and this is now for me, like, this is the, this is more manifesto, right? This is more of um, trying to kind of like live freely in front of you and kind of see what you think you want or, or uh, uh, see what you think works, right? This isn't necessarily like, follow me like the Corbusian points, right? This is much more like the, um, the, 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 the sort of uh, the point program of the Black Panther Party, right? Like it's, it's really about this, this sort of world building exercise where a lot of these different points attach themselves to other bigger things, right? So um, I think the first, the, the first thing that I always suggest is to radicalize yourself and then socialize architecture. And what I mean by that is um, one of the, the, the sort of, the biggest issues I find in being a person in the United States um, is a lack of political education. Um, and by a political education, I mean a political education of, um, uh, of politics the way that are understood globally, right? We are, uh, 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 we're an, an empire, right? And so the way that we're taught um, politics, you know, we, 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 we're, 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 we're sort of operating from this, this incredibly privileged perch and so I think it's important to understand a lot of words that get thrown around. Um, and I tried to make it like really, really simple on um, the next few slides. Uh, out, it might be even a little bit reductive, but they kind of set for me like a, a little bit of a tone to understand um, where perhaps architecture exists. So every slide that I have 
has some descriptions of this kind of po the political ideology at the center. And then the next slide, I, I have these, these sort of uh, icons that suggest where architecture lives in that system, right? And again, this is not science. This is really just me making some observations and trying to you know, convince you of the thing. Um, so let's, let's start with capitalism, right? Um, what are some of the things that make capitalism capital, right? So the first one is the ability to accumulate capital, right? Um, the second one is a, a sort of strong interest in private property, uh, as well as um, the, the ability for private property and capital to kind of be flexible uh, and be accumulated flexibly to uh, quote David Harvey. Um, the, the, the second one, the third point is that there are product markets, right? So there's like a sort of competitive market for products. And specifically a mainstay of capitalism is there's a competitive market for labor, meaning that when we get a job, we are selling our labor to somebody, right? Um, I think uh, um, a lot of folks uh, don't understand that makes you a product. Um, and that's a, a little, it's weird, right? Like, I think when, once you unsee that, you know, you can't, I mean, so once you see that, you can't unsee that. Um, however, it is, let's say, voluntary exchange in the sense that you get to sometimes pick who you sell that labor to unless you are in a prison or a jail um, and you don't have that voluntary exchange because of the 13th Amendment that effectively allows slavery to occur if you are incarcerated, right? Um, the, the concept I want you to, to kind of leave with in terms of capitalism is concept of wage slavery, meaning that, you know, you, we are all technically uh, um, uh, 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 slaves to a wage. If we don't have a wage and we're not independently wealthy, we have a problem, right? Um, either debtors' prisons or, you know, at worst, or like at least somebody's going to be calling you to pay a bill, right? And it's based entirely on class stratification. Because of this system, there needs to be classes that have a lot right, like billionaire class, and then most of us, right, uh, that don't. Um, everyone in this room, I'm not 100% sure there's a billionaire in this room, but we are a lot closer to poverty in this room than we are to being a billionaire. So that's capitalism in, in, a, in a very, very reductive nutshell. Um, but where does architecture exist in that, right? For me, it actually, you know, capitalism is very nimble, so, it's nimble, so it exists in a lot of different places. Right. Of course, they're all kind of connected. So these boxes for me represent where like architecture currently exists. And like for us, where we as architects are doing a disservice to ourselves if we don't understand where they exist. Right. So for sure, in capital accumulation, you have capital, you can build, uh, you can build buildings. Um, the idea of flexible accumulation, if you own property, you can liquidate. Right. So it becomes flexible in that way. Um, product market, labor market, real estate market. Right. Um, and then, of course, voluntary exchange you effectively can sell the, your house to whoever you want and you can rent from a landlord, right? And a landlord could set prices however they want regardless of if you can or not, and you can't. And of course, class stratification is a very um, aesthetically significant part of architecture in the United States, right? Um, but I, you know, I, I, think, uh, I, I think it's important too to, to, to acknowledge um, that um, capitalism is really interesting in that we don't like, talk about it so much here. Like it just happens all the time in every single kind of exchange that we do. And, um, you know, Mark Fisher many years ago um, wrote a book called Capitalist Realism where he sort of takes that on. Um, and um, he, he, he really takes it from the perspective of, you know, what is realism, right? Um, and why, uh, let's say capitalism is very different than um, than, than other kind of isms. Um, uh, and and, and I, I really enjoy a lot of these kind of points. So this is just a, a, a really simple meme that, that sort of shows you how kind of insidious uh, um, a lot of stuff um, in our contemporary world is, right? Um, so fascism, fascism is an interesting one. That's a big word. Um, and it's one that um, certainly, uh, I don't know if it gets thrown around as much as like communism, but um, it certainly is one that gets thrown around a lot in my household. Um, and I think some of the tenets of it, like when you, when you look at it, like um, I, I, I hope it makes you worried, right? Because there are things about like the current state of certain political po like policies in the United States 
that perhaps are like that sound like this, you know. Um, obviously, nationalism is an easy one, um, but uh, nationalism is a tricky is a tricky one, right? Uh, it's it's one that that you see um, sort of critique from the left very seriously, but also embraced in the left as well. And so, in this case, you know, that's one part of it. Perhaps the most important part of fascism, right? and you see here, I did not put a um, a concentration camp in here as an example. It's obviously inc incredibly related to it. Um, but I want you to understand that, you know, when the book was written on fascism by Benito Mussolini, um, he, he, and I have the quote of it uh, in, in a minute, um, you know, corporatism, I think, is a better way to understand it. There is no separation between the corporation and the state. Um, it's incredibly anti worker, right? So since it's so pro business, it's anti worker. Um, there's compulsory exchange, meaning that you're forced to sort of engage in the system, right? Of course, that's anti-democratic, and cronyism is a big part of it, right? Um, so where does where does architecture lie in, let's say, a, a, a fascist system, right? Um, certainly in uh, issues around national identity, specifically in corporatism, because you know it's sort of a place that has sort of held. Uh, it, it sort of holds all the power, and so it'll hold all access to that. And of course, in cronyism. Um, so th th this is uh, this is an image of Benito Mussolini's doctrine of fascism, and in it he suggests that um, fascism should be called corporatism because it is a merger of the state and the corporate power. Um, and I'm one of these people that if somebody uh, you know you know shows you who they are, believe them. Um, so I, I want you to think about that, right, uh, in terms of our own kind of like political landscape and ask ourselves if perhaps we rely too much on corporations here in the United States to do things for us. And one of the things that like worries me in terms of architecture and in terms of access to housing is in the pandemic, just how much houses have been bought up by multi, like, like, like national corporations um, and uh, what that kind of means. So that's a big bummer. Um, in terms of the, some, of some of the main differences between this, these kind of like systems, right? We have something like socialism, which, um, you know, in its, in its sort of uh, idealized sense, right? Uh, is interested in internationalism, right? So it's not perhaps um, interested in this concept of borders. Uh, and instead it's much more interested in um, solidarity and, um, and exchange. Um, uh, whereas, you know, something like capitalism is interested in like, free labor or like free trade, right? Um, socialism does have a very strong state, um, which is, uh, we'll look at anarchism in a minute, but you know, basically that is the sort of main centralized and kind of socialized institution, right? Um, everything is sort of related to the state there, but since there's no market, there's planned economies instead of market economies, there's unionized workforce, and to an extent less class stratification. Um, and I think architecture exists much more in the kind of planned economy and then the centralized and socialized institutions. So it's a very simple kind of like uh, uh, diagram of the kind of scientific history of, um, of, 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 you know, effectively how the world has engaged each other, right? And so here are the stages. This is a kind of Marxist simple breakdown, right? Um, where you effectively, you know, have no classes in a kind of primitive communal sense. Um, and then in slavery, and during slavery, you have slave owners and then slaves, feudalism, you know, like there's a, there's a, a, a contradiction that occurs. Um, let's say slavery is abolished, right? And then you have feudalism where you have landowners and serfs. Serfs have to work to live on the land. If not, they can't live there anymore. Then you have capitalism, right? Where you have folks that own the means of production, the bourgeoisie, you know, the proletariat, the folks that let sort of create the profit for the bourgeoisie, right? Then you have this next stage would be socialism where you have state managers and workers. And then of course, you know, and like communism and anarchism, this idea is always pointing towards no class. And so in anarchism, um, autonomy is super important. Cooperation is super important. Um, there is no, it's an abolition of the state. Um, it's largely based on direct action and mutual aid and it's voluntary associations, right? Um, this is something that does not look to the armature of like a politic to do much. This is about our kind of voluntary engagement with each other. And these, let's maybe solve them, maybe smaller cells, right? Of, of, of communities, right? That sort of look out for each other. And in many ways, um, I think, 
my own engagement with the world right now is much closer to this than anything else, specifically because of mutual aid. Um, and I think architecture can exist as a practice in here, but it exists in a couple of different ways, right? It exists, I think, in the realm of mutual aid. Like if someone needs housing, you could effectively think of like a, uh, a, a sort of anarchist architectural uh, system um, that is all about making sure people have shelter. Um, and that happens through cooperation and direct action. So I think that's a, a, a very kind of simplistic way to deal with that. And then of course, um, anti-fascism, um, which is the word that we're using. Um, I particularly like this one because it's much more of an umbrella term for abolitionist socialists and anarchists. Um, it's a way to sort of think about solidarity um, across a kind of political spectrum. Um, but it shares a lot of the things that are shared uh, in, in, in uh, anarchism here. Um, and I think architecture, again, exists in this like traditional space of shelter, right? When I use the term humankind, I think about that. And then, of course, mutualism and mutual aid. Um, um, there's a term that we like to use a lot here, right, uh, in all of our work. I know that, that, um, that Joseph brought it up, but it's this, this concept of abolition. And abolition um, is, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, not a fairly old American practice, but it really sort of um, emerges uh, during slavery. Um, and it is, you know, part in the United States, it's certainly one of the first times where, um, you know, white folks have solidarity with black folks, and they are, uh, uh, some are, are, are sort of working to, um, you know, put a wrench in the system of slavery before the end of it, which that means, you know, helping with, uh, uh, you know, um, housing people, making sure that they're getting to states where, 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 uh, where slavery, slavery is already abolished um, and moving through. In terms of a contemporary sense, maybe where you heard the term the most was in the summer of 2020, um, and you heard of ideas around defunding the police, around um, uh, the abolition of the prison industrial complex, right? Um, and so these are some simple points, right? It's like the eight to abolition uh, hashtag that was super, super popular in that, in, that, in that case. And I always thought like for architects, like when you see this, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking to myself like, my gosh, like imagine if like that was my job is provide safe housing for everyone. Not like to create a kind of infinite amount of like new products uh, and new types of forms and shapes and stuff. Like I love that stuff for sure, but I, I, I even critique why I love that, right? Because I feel like it's much more closer to like the creation of a product versus like the creation of shelter and the creation of safety. Um, and so that, that kind of, that, that contradiction, that tension is a lot of where we kind of practice from. Um, and, and we're not, you know, in architecture, we're probably not speaking about it as much as in art and in different forms of culture. This is a new book that just came out. These are two books that just came out recently. Um, I recommend uh, anyone pick up, I have it in my backpack right now, Abolition Feminisms. Um, and you have some fantastic uh, Chicago uh, artists that are, are covered in that book, like Maria Gaspar, uh, an incredible prison abolitionist um, who grew up in the South Side uh, and um, uh, whose practice uh, is, is, is one that really, you know, took my interest in prison abolition to another level, um, but she, she's represented in that book. And, and there's so many people um, like her there. Um, you have Jennifer Ponce de Leon, a uh, book about um, uh, this idea of the arts of rebellion, right? Um, another aesthetics is possible. Definitely give me a lot of, um, a, 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 a lot of hope, right? Um, one of my favorite quotes um, is Fred Hampton's quote. Fred Hampton uh, was murdered when he was 21 uh, years old by the Chicago police. Um, and he was the chairman of the Black Panther Party uh, himself. Uh, he studied law in school and he like successfully like defended himself in court over a really bogus charge um, that Chicago police tried to get on him. And, and then of course the coordinated assassination of, of him while he slept. There's a movie that just came out about it as well. Really don't like that movie because it really, really focuses on like the person that set him up and not that much on him. Um, but I really love this quote um, uh, because I believe it. And I think that we have to really, we have to be very serious about both of these things. But if we're not aiming our interest towards practice and we, we got a problem, right? Um, 
So my second point after this kind of like perhaps boring political education, I mean, I could talk about the differences in political systems all day, but I, I, I think this question is how do we do this? Which is for me, the most important thing that we can do right now. Um, and you know, the, the simple answer to that um, is uh, it depends. Each of these things depends on a lot of things, right? Um, you probably can't do anything from the seat that you're sitting in right now, but collectively you could do a lot more than you think you can. Um, there's already a lot of things happening um, around you, around this city, around cities like Chicago, um, that I think could be very, very uh, inspiring and, and um, uh, uh, life-changing to be a part of. So when I think about this, I think about case studies in, in, in uh, uh, sort of examples of it, right? Um, so the, 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 the thing I, I think about is how can we do this with architecture, right? Like that's maybe the first thing I think about. And there's this incredible Angela Davis quote um, where she says that progressive art can assist people to learn not only about the objective forces that work in society in which they live, but also about the intensely social character of their interior lives. Ultimately, it can propel people towards social emancipation. It's an understanding that this kind of progressive art, or in our case, progressive architecture or anti-fascist architecture, can be a very powerful vehicle for somebody that maybe is not there yet. Maybe it's the bridge that gets somebody into their kind of activist practice that they'll continue on moving forward and then liberate the next person behind them, right? So there's that, right? Um, but how does that look, right, outside of, let's say, architecture? So here's a couple of examples of that. Um, in the late 1980s, and I, have, I realize I have a lot of Portland uh, um, uh, uh, images here, and it's so funny because when I got to Portland, all I was showing was Chicago things. Um, and then now I have like a lot of Portland things, which I think is a sign that like I'm, I'm kind of okay with Portland now. Um, and so I'm coming out and saying that, you know, like I guess I'm from Portland. Um, so this is, this is anti-racist action. Um, I know that you probably have heard the term anti-racism, uh, in, 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 incredible, um, in, incredible books uh, 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 sort of emerging uh, over the last few years around anti-racism from Ibram X. Kendi um, and, other, and, and, and other comrades like working specifically on, let's say not just popularizing this term, but, but really um, sort of putting kind of like legs under it in terms of institution and world building. Um, but really in the United States, one of the, the, the kind of first times that this becomes really popular is in 1988 in Portland actually. Um, so um, one of the things about the Pacific Northwest that is uh, really um, uh, interesting, maybe you don't all know, um, I mean, like a lot of the United States, but really, really like late into the history, even into the 20th century, um, it was founded as a white ethno state. So it was illegal to be black there. It wasn't a sundown town, it was a sundown state, um, which means that if you're, you're black after sundown, you could be arrested, right, or worse. And, and so, um, the, 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 the history of sort of racism as, and white supremacy as a kind of policy reality of the state of Oregon um, is something that still to this day is being like rewritten through like the state constitution and that stuff. Now in 1988, it was a, 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 a really difficult time in, in, in Portland. Um, there were, it, it became a kind of hub for white supremacy. Um, and specifically racist, um, like, like uh, racist skinheads, which are referred to as boneheads um, in, 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 in Portland. Um, and it was a time when a lot of people started to move there. It was a couple of years before like the big influx of the 90s, where a lot of people started to move there. And then in the, the, the late 2000s, and then even the late, in the mid 2010s when I moved there, these were like the big migrations of people moving to Portland. Um, and it also meant that immigrants were moving to Portland as well. And in 1988, there was an Ethiopian immigrant and student who was uh, 20 years old. Uh, he was murdered by um, neo-Nazis in Portland. His name was Mulugeta Sarah. Um, and what that started at that moment, um, I think is really inspirational. Anti-racist action emerges from that. But what anti-racist action is, it's a loose kind of like anarchist network of um, anti-racist skinheads, of white, brown, black, indigenous folks, punks, uh, lawyers, um, architects, thinkers, et cetera, working to find ways to drive Nazis out of town. And they did that through violence. 
They also did that through legal means. The term doxing is something that we use now because of anti-racist action. These critical legal scholars that were coming out of Lewis and Clark College in, in Southeast Portland um, really kind of popularized that system and putting pressure on companies to like to, to, to fire somebody that like beat up a, a black kid on the street the week before, right? Um, and for me, what anti-racist action means is, is uh, uh, let's say a lot bigger, um, it, it, it's a lot bigger in my life because of my involvement with punk. Um, and that was, you know, meeting for the first time, um, uh, folks like Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice, the Sharps. Um, and these are folks that are, are black and brown, uh, that are into punk rock music, but also uh, into, I mean, to put it bluntly, fighting Nazis. Um, on this middle uh, sign is the Iron uh, Front logo, which is an, effectively like an anti-fascist logo. Um, and then here, what you see there, this was taken a few years ago um, at the Portland Timbers game. Um, and this is like where the, the, let's call it the ultras, that's what you call the ultra supporters. Um, they were banned from using that symbol um, at, uh, at the game by, um, uh, by the MLS, by the ma Major League Soccer here in the United States. And uh, that day, they decided to still bring that symbol in and waited until the 33rd minute to sing Bella Ciao, the famous Italian anti-fascist album, I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, anthem. Um, another uh, version of, of, of sort of fighting uh, things on the street, right, is this idea of like the Immigrant Defense Project. And I think a lot back to um, the that kind of original Muslim band that the Trump administration put out um, and the influx and pour, outpour of support where you had lawyers and you had people that were, you know, using their voices and their bodies to make it heard, you know, in the airports themselves, right? This is like pre-pandemic, right? Like our lives are so different, right? Um, it just feels like decades ago at this point. But the idea of the Immigrant Defense Project is something important. And it's not just stuff like this and saying that you support immigrants, but it's like going and working on like uh, not allowing ice into a house that someone's in, right? It's really about putting yourselves right on the line. So. The third point, which I think is one that's maybe a little bit easier to do is fighting the recuperation of radical language. And I mean by recuperation, I mean co-option, right? This idea of co-opting. It happens a lot um, in not just our institutions, but also um, in, our, uh, in our kind of like, let's say broader political uh, spectrum where you see these terms that are used by, uh, by like, let's say radical activists on the street doing things like mutual aid, like concepts of defund, et cetera. And then they effectively like get used and uh, they become meaningless, right? Um, I think we do that a lot, a lot in architecture. I think about like the idea of like affordable housing, right? As a sort of concept, like how, you know, how do we even engage in, a, we use it as a terminology, but there has to be a kind of fundamental critique of the system that makes housing unaffordable. To, to make that even like, you know, relevant, right? I think about things like this, um, you know, uh, like Black Lives Matter Plaza, uh, you know, let's, let's paint it on the street, um, but, de you know, decarceration is not gonna happen um, and uh, free speech, good luck, right? Um, I think about this, um, you can buy it. Uh, that, that I took a picture yesterday. Um, it's not the most terrible design. Um, um, but I also think about this, which is a, a kind of a, a, a bigger bummer, um, where you have um, institutions uh, and architecture practices that are um, supposed to be interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as you know, this particular practice suggesting that they're interested in anti-racism, whilst at the same time um, building um, police stations and building uh, prisons and continuing to do so. Um, that effectively, uh, uh, hurting the communities that they say they support, right? You can't have one with the other, right? Um, that's a little bit more black and white, in my opinion. So um, they could probably just lose the DEI quote. And, you know, I mean, at least if they were honest, they'd be like, yeah, we support the police, you know? So this is an interesting one, right? This is one that I've been thinking about for a minute. So this is maybe where we're going to get a little bit into, let's say, architectural aesthetics a bit more. I think we're going to move through aesthetics moving from now on. Um, 
Chameleonism. What is chameleonism? Um, it's a term that I'm, I'm starting to, to, to use um, as a critique of certain, uh, let's say, practices in architecture that um, think that they need to sort of change or to th think that it's valuable to be able to change depending on who you like work with or like what you're doing. Um, what's, what, 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 what that's kind of like saying is like, I think about folks like Le Corbusier um, that played both sides, right? Uh, could design for a communist government as well as a kind of pseudo fascist government. And architecture suggesting, you know what? Our job isn't to get in the middle of what's bet, like a value judgment on who to practice for, but our job is to make the best building possible, right? I think that's kind of what chameleonism starts to be. Um, another form of that, and maybe more specifically, is I think of you know Philip Johnson as a chameleon. You know, um, I think that uh, 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 you know Philip Johnson was very honest about himself being a chameleon. Um, this is an essay that he wrote about uh, the house at New Canaan, where he explains each of the places that he kind of like stole from to produce the house. Now, there's a bit of honesty that I do perhaps appreciate here in terms of aesthetic influences, but when you think about his work specifically, I don't think about it um, as one style. I think about it as a sort of series of, of kind of chameleon uh, um, approaches. But why is he a chameleon, right? Um, as you may or may not know, uh, uh, you know, Phil Johnson was in, in, in very supportive early on of, of, of National Socialist Germany and Adolf Hitler. Um, this is his first built project. It is a stage for Father McLaughlin, who was uh, a very conservative, um, fiery preacher who also supported the Nazis in the United States. This is his first built project, right, um, in the US. Um, and, you know, we then, of course, have the kind of high modernist period. You know, I could have put the Chippendale building here, but I picked another one. I could have put the Met. But, you know, I, I, I picked this one, and then you have this sort of like weird formalist one. Now, I know a lot of the folks in this room are probably saying, well, you know, it's obvious that somebody in his office designed it, right? I understand that. You know, I understand how that goes. Um, but this question of influence and opportunity, I think at its core, has this idea of architecture as a product in terms of capital. And I think, and, I, and this is someone who likes a lot of different aesthetics, but I, I think the, the kind of chameleonism of that idea, of the let's say commodification or the, the, product, the productification of architecture, um, at its core is actually really conservative and problematic. Um, and I don't know if it necessarily serves us as well. That's not to say that let's not be able to adapt. That's to say that perhaps we remove the value from this idea that architecture is a product. Um, but I also think that it has to do with the generic as well. Um, and it has to do with this idea that perhaps context doesn't matter. Um, so this is, of course, from, from SML Excel, from Kuhas. Um, and it's one of the most famous quotes. It's the one that everyone talks about. But this idea of like, you know, context doesn't really matter. And what Kuhas is really getting at there is that there's a globalized architectural project already occurring. And he certainly was the face of it for a very long time, continues to be, and many star architects are. Um, but, but it's weird to say that I'm against chameleonism and yet at the same time bring up projects like this, right? Where you, you, know, you see certain kind of aesthetic trends that are dealing with here. You know, Kuas in 2014 at the Venice Biennale, um, you know, famously critiqued contemporary architecture as kind of looking all the same. Um, but it's, it's ironic for me, at least, in that um, I wonder if he was also maybe critiquing himself there. Um, because that's certainly something that, that, that happens much more often than not in a lot of the current ONA projects, for, very different than perhaps the 1980s and even some of the 90s projects. Um, and so his project of the generic and the globalized, I think also find their way into this idea of, of chameleonism, not because of sameness, but because of like this sort of like blandness that changes or this uh, abundance of bland options. Um, that, that become very normalized in architecture. So I'm still teasing that out. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it's what I'm working on. I'm going to effectively write this, this essay. It's a big part of my book. Um, so TBD, you know, like let's, let, let's talk about it in a couple of months. Um, so aesthetics at every angle, color on every surface, right? 
Um, it is no surprise. You know my practice is in, it's very interested in color. We had a great conversation today in Joseph's class around the use of color. For me, color is cultural, color is personal. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think color is universally applicable at all. Um, I don't think it's very valuable to think of color uh, as, um, as deterministic necessarily um, uh, or as like cognitive either. Um, uh, I think in many ways the way color is like, let's say taught, um, it has to do with self-fulfilling prophecies, right? So instead of like, you know, uh, you know, science says that red makes you feel like angry, you just hear that red is, is angry. And so, yeah, you know what? Every time you see something red, you're angry. Um, so I, I think color is cultural, right? Uh, we were talking about um, like the color yellow uh, and um, it meaning something very different uh, to someone that perhaps grows up in Peoria and someone that, that grows up in, in Lima, Peru and, uh, and wears you know, yellow underwear for uh, New Year's Eve, right? It means something completely different, right? Um, so color is cultural in that. And I think in, in that way, it's, color is an incredible vehicle for solidarity uh, with, with people that, um, that sort of engage that. Um, so what does that look like, you know, historically? Um, I think there are a lot of beautiful projects in the world um, that uh, have really kind of uh, uh, thought about that. And, and this, is, this is a body of work of Boris Isakielis, the Congolese uh, artist. Um, and you know what, I mean, not a traditional architect, but certainly this work lives in my head rent-free and in, lives in, in a lot of people's head rent-free in terms of influence. Um, and I hope that it starts to do that for you. Um, but these are, these are effective sculptures that, um, that, 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 that Kingelis made. Um, you know, thinking about what his hometown could be like if it was different. For example, if the global South wasn't just a place for extraction and instead, was a, a, a place for sort of building a, a kind of new community in a new world. And so he uses this very specific form, let's say postmodernism, um, in a much more radical and kind of social way um, than it was you know, pretty much practiced in the world, which if anyone knows anything about postmodernism is, is really the kind of architecture of capitalism. It really is the architecture of power in the eighties. Um, and you know, a lot of, of people in the generations before me had a huge aesthetic allergy to it, and I understand, right? But there are practices that existed like this in different places that did not, you know, sort of succumb, let's say, to that. Here are some other versions of projects. I mean, these are just ridiculous, right? Um, I would love to see this built, you know? No, but all we get is, uh, what's it called? The, the, the half uh, Gibson Les Paul Hard Rock Hotel, you know, like, uh, in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, which is like ridiculous. Like, you know, there's no mountains in Florida, so you're driving, you can see it. It's, it's, really, it's really weird. And as a person that plays guitar, it really upsets me every time that I really wanna see the rest of the neck of the Gibson and just don't even get me started, you know? Um, you have this other, again, continue work of, of, of this. This is the, the stadium. Um, I love the color palette on this one a lot. I think if you look at that and you look at the altar, it's like, I don't know, <laughs> I think you may. I mean, maybe I did. I, 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 it's, it's an interesting one. Um, you also have projects like this that are more contemporary. This is a fountain for survivors by Pamela Council, who is an artist. Um, uh, she made this beautiful, beautiful project um, in, um, in Times Square. And it's, it's obviously about female anatomy, but it's also about um, survivance, right? Which is a term that she used um, to, to speak about this, this project. Um, what's really beautiful about this is like, you can kind of tell that it's, it's, it's sort of dealing with this idea of, um, of a very specific form of anatomy. Um, and yet at the same time, when you look closer, you start to realize that it's also kind of an aestheticized and sort of cultural object, right? So this is made up of like beauty product, right? This is made up of, your, of, of jewels, it's made up of, um, uh, of, of acrylic nails, right? Um, and, and, and thinking about that as a unit in architecture, I think about um, like a panel, right? In a kind of parametric sense, right? Uh, when you look at just how beautiful that is. And then this sort of interiority that is just, I mean, you know, um, it's super important, super um, uh, powerful. Um, yeah, 
And then, of course, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't speak of Freddy Mamani Silvestre and, and the amazing work that he's been doing in Bolivia for the, almost the last 20 years. Um, you know, uh, th th this work is, 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 according to him, it's Neo-Andean, right? Um, he is Aymaden, uh, which is the indigenous tribe that he is a part of um, in Bolivia. Um, and I think the, the thing about the West is that we're obsessed with this work, but a lot of the people that I know that are obsessed with this work are really not obsessed with the political climate that allows this work to emerge, right? Particularly the, um, uh, the, the election of Evo Morales in 2006 um, to, uh, to, to be the president of Bolivia, um, Evo Morales himself being the first indigenous president um, of Bolivia, legalizing the production of coca leaf, which is something that uh, the indigenous populations uh, and the Amaran people in Bolivia uh, were not allowed to do because of the war on drugs um, that was perpetuated by the United States, specifically on indigenous uh, communities all up and down the South American continent. Um, and so what that allowed to do like, was the development of a new Aymaran middle class that was interested in starting to, in kind of in a flexible accumulation uh, sense, start to build uh, properties. Um, and these are salones de eventos. Uh, these are effectively places for events. Um, but there are also little social condensers, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, right now, I mean, he, he's, de he's definitely in the hundreds right now in terms of buildings. Um, but these, these buildings in particular uh, look to uh, in, in, uh, sort of in, in like indigenous history and Aymaran culture for color and for form, um, and then use uh, these sort of really intense kind of formal approaches to achieve the exteriors, but then the interiors themselves are also like radically, radically painted. He has more painters on his payroll than he does anything else. Right, so there's a point before like this project is done, uh, where everything is like it's like rhino render gray, and then painters come in, and then it looks like that. Um, and so it's this question again of like solidarity with like the building trades, which I'll also get to in a minute. Um, so yeah, that's Mamani, and that's color on every surface. Embed yourselves in the communities you work for. So this is a, an interesting one because I think for a lot of folks, architects, um, you know, who are we beholden to, right? Technically, here in the United States, we're holding to our clients. Um, I would also suggest that we'll be holding to each other. Um, and hopefully, with you'll see point 0.7 in a minute, or point 0.8, I forget which one it is, um, we'll be um, holding to ourselves as a union more so than as um, independent workers against each other, selling our labor. But you know, instead, uh, working uh, in solidarity to negotiate our labor. Um, and so what does that mean, embedding yourselves in the communities you work with, right? It's about making sure that you are not just caricaturizing the kind of people that you're making architecture for, right? And I think that's a modus operandi of contemporary architecture here in the United States. Um, now, there are other versions of that. And again, this is something that I, I, I was a part of in 2016 um, when I first moved to Portland and I saw this city initiative that was occurring. This is just one example of it, but um, you know, what does it look like if you, know, you worked on houselessness um, I, you know, outside of the sort of traditional, like we need a much like stronger um, affordable housing infrastructure and housing infrastructure in the United States. Um, and what you see at this point in, you know, now six years ago um, is this sort of development of, of these, uh, we call them sleeping pods. We didn't call them tiny homes because we want them to, to be understood as transitional. So the goal of this work has always been about making sure that there is permanent housing after and not necessarily like, here you go, here's an architectural product, buy it from me, I'm done, right? Which is kind of what Los Angeles tried to do a few years ago. And architects really, really foamed at the mouth to try to get um, uh, uh, a notoriety for making those ADU projects, accessory dwelling unit projects in Los Angeles. Um, and so participatory democracy for me is really important. Um, and this is, you know, it looks like a very Portland scene to me. This is definitely a meeting that went on too long. Um, and uh, it, 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 but you know, I, I think, Democracy isn't easy and democracy isn't slow. Um, and so when I think about like engagement with public communities, I think about these like slow processes, you know? Not slow processes because of the red tape of, of, of like 
you know, bureaucracy, but um, uh, the process being something that takes time because so many people are, are being input into it and are, are, are sort of thinking about it. I mean, there's a whole like development system for building these um, that was created, which I thought was, you know, really fantastic. And this is the Kenton Women's Village, um, which is a very interesting project because uh, when the creation of this project happened, Kenton, which is a neighborhood in Northeast Portland, um, was really, really on the fence about it. You know, a lot of NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, right? A lot of NIMBYs in the world did not want like houseless, you know, women and children living behind their homes. Um, let's just say after a few years, there was a vote uh, about whether to keep or not keep it. And um, it was like 199 to six that wanted to keep it because they actually like saw what housing infrastructure and activism could potentially do. Um, it's uh, not ironic uh, because obviously the houseless issue in the United States is only getting exacerbated and that's a function of capitalism, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a, uh, you know, um, broken record here, but yes, let's unionize architectural workplaces now. Um, you know, what, what does that mean, right? Like, um, well, it means that we need to support uh, not only the conceptualization of ideas around unionization, but also knowing the history of things like the Sherman Antitrust Act, which make things like price, um, uh, price fixing, right? Or um, uh, like, you know, people agreeing, like different, um, different companies agreeing on a price for architecture and a wage, let's say, uh, makes that illegal because the only thing in capitalism that is uh, compulsory is competition, right? Not cooperation. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to say that, yeah, we, we got our first union. And you know how unions work, right? Unions are a domino effect. Um, and I'm happy to be in Illinois, right? Chicago, where the eight hour workday here in the United States was born, right? At the Haymarket, right? I'm very proud of that. And I've always been proud of that. Um, so this is just me reminding you, you know, uh, that I hope that you inherit a much more supportive uh, architectural practice and profession for you and for as a worker, right? Um, so one of the, the sort of key things that we're suggesting, right? Um, there have been a lot of ideas of updating concepts of program, updating concepts of function. I really love mutual aid as this, let's say, political update to the concept of program and function. Um, which is to say mutual aid takes action and form and sort of gives us the ability to sort of work through those things, right? And, and it's existed forever, right? Concepts of mutual aid. I think about Narcomfine by Moise Gimberg in Moscow um, that, uh, you know, remove the, the, the kind of kitchen um, from the heart of, of uh, the individual unit um, and then made it a collective kitchen and what that es essentially did at that point in Russian history was to create a much more equal gender playing field, meaning that women weren't necessarily stuck in one place cooking and cleaning. And instead there's this collective approach to cooking for a collective, right? Um, the idea of removing a kitchen from the inside of your house and making a collective kitchen, that's an architectural idea. Right, that's something that like we could we can point to in a diagram and say, right? Um, so that's one example of something that happened, you know, almost a hundred years ago at this point. Um, here is our more dilapidated Narcan in 2015. Um, it looks like things like the free breakfast program that the Black Panther Party did in the 1960s and 70s um, in the United States, across the United States, specifically in Chicago, places like Oakland, as well as in Portland. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of Oregon, of, of, of Oregon history. Um, the Black Panther Party in Oregon um, had their free breakfast program, and it was so successful that the governor of Oregon, literally the next year, mandated free breakfast programs for the entire uh, uh, school age population in Oregon. And they're like, we sure showed the Black Panthers. And they're like, well, that was the point. So we got that. We got that. Done. Like, th so there's this idea that even like, don't wait for the legislation to happen with mutual aid. You can start doing these projects now. Again, this is, this is real American history, you know? Um, it looks like as, at the aesthetics of, of uh, in, in this case, the sort of AIDS movement. I think about the silence equals death posters that Keith Haring 
was, you know, a, a, a essential in, in, in bringing out comparing himself, passed away from AIDS, um, complication of AIDS, uh, and at the, the height of his career. Um, and this, this sort of aesthetic, this pink triangle, right, really became this sort of force in that. You could not unsee it, right? Like think about if you can create an architecture that, that had that kind of radical power. I mean, obviously we try to try it. We try to do that, you know, like I hope you don't forget about this thing that I just put out there. Um, and I think it's okay to like want that for your architecture. Um, I think about autonomous schools, right? Uh, in, 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 uh, in Chiapas, the Zapatista schools, right? Um, these are the schools that for example, uh, are, are um, you know, during like, let's say raids on Zapatista communities and stuff, they're the first things to get burned burned down because they know that education is a weapon, right? They know that if kids can't learn their own history and that if you, you know, keep them in the dark, right? Um, then it's gonna be easier to deal with them later. Um, and so it's always interesting to me that something as, as sort of innocuous as a school is so dangerous, right? Um, but it also looks like this. This is, I pulled this up today, Mutual Aid Hub. Um, you can look for all types of mutual aid that exist right now in your communities and places you live, where your parents live, right, uh, here in the US. Um, and there is a, a kind of large scale mutual aid hub. In a way, this is the anarchist internet, right? It's really straightforward. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that you, that you haven't experienced housing insecurity. I hope that you haven't ex experienced food insecurity. But my work um, as a chair of the, the sort of DI task force at Portland State University has led me to know that a large percentage of, of a much larger percentage that we perhaps think of students have experienced that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume there's people in this room that have experienced that, right? There's no shame necessarily in looking for help and looking for food and looking for those things. And I think we need to use not just like our kind of expertise as architects to make those systems easier, but to make them more beautiful, to make them more radical, you can never forget about them, that they show institutions that that's what things need to look like. That's how things need to operate, right? I don't think about a grocery store when, when I'm thinking about the need for food. I think about a food bank, right? Where you don't have to pay for food, right? That's something like we teach our three-year-old right now. Like food should be a human right. Like why isn't it a human right? And so what that looks like is just being able to, see, you know, you could get granular and you see the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them here in Portland, or uh, there in Portland. Um, and this is what they, they start to look like. You know, this is the free fridge and, and pantry movement. Um, you have the needle exchanges and the sort of syringe drop-off boxes. You know, we have a lot of issues with public drug use, right? Um, and so that's a, a, um, a, a simple way to get needles off the street. But of course, people are worried, like they're like, well, if you bring a syringe exchange, you're gonna have more needles. All I have to tell you is think about trash cans. You know, trash cans were like that too, right? People were anti-trash cans because they thought that if you brought trash cans somewhere then like maybe it'll make it dirtier, but without trash cans, where does the trash go, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not actually, it is very simple. Um, and this is work that we did um, in Chicago and then sort of traveled everywhere. We, we created a, um, a safe injection um, site uh, kind of educational space. Um, that is, was looking to um, uh, produce a kind of harm reduction architecture. Um, and this is called Safe Shape that I worked very closely with Dr. Greg Scott from DePaul University, a legendary harm reductionist in Chicago. Um, and uh, basically what it was, it was a space for educating the public around issues around, about harm reduction and specifically trying to legalize um, the use of these safe injection spaces. This is a form of architectural space that's illegal, right? Um, because in the 1980s, um, if this is something with the war on drugs, one of the, the sort of Reagan administration's policies that came out um, was a way to sort of, and this was very specific around flexible accumulation, a way to take ownership over uh, crack houses, right? Quote unquote, or drug houses. And if there was more than two drug users congregating in the house, effectively it could be an eminent domain and they could take it, right? Um, and so, we, we kind of like realized that we were working in that space because this is an educational project, but I'm not 100% sure how it's been used. It, it is all purpose can be used as an injection site. You know, all I did was effectively build it, right? Um, what I'm happy to say is that it was used in, uh, in places like New York, 
which we have images of here um, in Ithaca uh, and uh, in places like San Francisco and in Seattle, where they have now not fully legalized above ground safe injection sites, but have decriminalized it to a point where they could start to exist. Up until 2019, actually 2020, we were working on the first above ground one in the United States that was going to be fully legalized in the west side of Chicago. And that was February 2020. So unfortunately, all the money that we got from the, the, the city did not come out. So um, just wanted to show a couple of pictures of there. And of course, abolish the prison industrial complex. Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure if you knew this, but we are like, we're number one, we're number one, right? And like, we win that one, you know, um, which is a bummer. You know, um, I visited my dad in prison for a very long time. And um, uh, I, I wish I didn't know the prison system so well. Um, like, I don't know if like all you know the difference between jail and prison, you know, like I didn't know that until, well, I was very young when I realized the difference between that, but, um, you know, jails where you uh, wait for trial, prison is where you go to serve a sentence, right? Well, in the United States, um, we have a lot of people locked up and we have a lot of people locked up in local jails as well. This is how many people are locked up in jails waiting for trial. They haven't even been convicted yet. A lot of them are there for low level drug crimes, et cetera. And uh, um, a lot of them can't afford bail. So that's something in terms of decarceration that's been a big practice. Uh, and suggesting like uh, new ways of kind of dealing with that. And here in, in you know, in, in Illinois, in particular in Chicago, um, they dealt with it by getting rid of, of, of cash bail. Um, and, and that's something that has, has been a big issue. There are people in Chicago that wanna bring back cash bail, which makes it virtually impossible. You know, you can't have a bail bondsman, right? Which is a lot, it's like a credit card. It's a lot easier to get out of jail with a bail bondsman. And if you don't have the cash, you can't get out, right? So it is like, it's like a debtor's prison almost, you know? Um, this is the idea of pretrial pre policies driving jail growth, right? Jail growth is really interesting because that directly affects architecture. And you may have to work on one or you may decide to leave somewhere if they start working on one. And I have, I'm, I'm happy to say that I've had uh, students in practice like fight that, you know? So this is the last part of it where we kind of just deal with like the work, right? So um, these are the proofs of the type of work that we try to do. So you know, the, the, the thing that really drove uh, the altar is asking what are the principles that constitute an anti-fascist work of architecture? Um, and for us, we, we, we think that Alenar is more of a point of departure rather than a conclusion. Um, and it's a vehicle to sort of frame these, these candles and these projects, right? And here are the 40 candles and projects that represent a kind of global history of anti-fascist architecture. And they're all there. And I really recommend that you all jump in on them and enjoy them. But what's really great about this project is how many people we like brought in to do work. So we brought in Briar Levitt, who used to be the head editor of Bitch Magazine uh, in, in the Bay Area and in Portland for the la last 20 years. She's an associate professor at Portland State University. And um, I asked her to design us an anti-fascist font and so she, a typeface, sorry. A, a font is, uh, is to a typeface like a building is to architecture. Remember that for all the graphic designers. I, we have some in the room, so remember, respect the graphic designers, right? Um, and she came back with this really interesting approach which she, she's like, I'm not gonna do lower cases. I'm gonna mix them. And so this is not for, like, you're supposed to read these not as individual letters, they only work collectively, right? And so we decided to have this concept of anti-fascism like permeating everything from the graphic design to like the content, from the aesthetics to the content, right? Um, you know, there's, there's the, the kind of the wrap around the candles that we worked on, um, try to make it easy, right? To, to sort of read these, really call out some important parts. Um, I used all the accurate colors, the hex codes uh, on my, um, on uh, my Excel document to make sure that I was painting everything the right way. Um, and cause there was, as you can see, there's almost like, a, there's like probably 60 ish different like things that I needed to paint. And each of them needed like four coats of things. So I needed a really simple way to like figure that out. And so I, I color coded every single one because I wanted the color always around me. This is me slaving away at it in my garage. Um, it is a 1100 pound object 
again, I really thank the University of Illinois for supporting that because it was uh, a, a kind of a nightmare to, to make boxes for it and, and, and to bring it over. Um, and it was one, I did it by myself. Uh, so that was really difficult. Throughout the process, we, we, we like created these images that started to kind of speak to us about the color combinations. And I just wanted, like this one is not supposed to be a photorealistic image, but it's something that's supposed to just like be in front of me as I'm working on the work, testing the colors out. Um, when we decided and kind of when we needed um, to bring a cable to hold this, you know, 200 pound uh, icon at the top of the altar, we wanted to model it and see how it would look against it and see how um, maybe some of the shadows might look against it, you know. Um, so we really like treated this as a building. And another way to think about this project is that that project's at a 16th scale. I want you to think about it that way. In a way, it's an altar, but it's also a model for a very, very, very large building. That'd be really fun to hang out in. Um, and so this is it at, uh, at Stephen Hole's um, uh, building um, at uh, Bellevue, Washington, apartment eight, um, at the Bellevue Biennial. Um, and so this question about a genealogy for anti-fascist architecture is, is the book, right? So we're, we're thinking about this as a working title right now. So my, 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 my sort of main, uh, um, a person I'm working on it with is, is Daniel Jonas Roche, uh, who is an architect, a designer, a, a critic, a historian, um, a kind of expert on Soviet architecture. And I, I sort of bring kind of the global south and, uh, and also this kind of aesthetics approach into the book. So we're really trying to deal with it there. And we ask ourselves these two questions or, or three points, right? Which is, can mutual aid networks and social condensers be reframed as anti-fascist architecture? And what are the aesthetic hallmarks of people power and so we created these boards to accompany the exhibit as well and actually have them. And these boards basically are looking like uh, this, where you go through each of these points um, and you kind of deal with some of the histories of the candles. And then we decided to look at different points in those histories and try to tease out another genealogy of that specific point. Like for example, here talking about how OMA may, you know, depoliticize the social condenser. It's very important um, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, you know, socialist approach to, uh, to architecture and then made it into this kind of like capitalist space. <clears throat> Mutual aid architectures, the ones that we were looking at earlier and how they sort of relate to all the different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, processes of mutual aid historically. And then the aesthetics of people power and how that, that sort of looks. So um, really the kind of artistic and the architectural together. Um, and from here, uh, we decided to focus on this project up here by Alphonse Lorencic um, for our final project. This is the last project that I'm showing today, uh, which is currently on view in Chicago at the 11 in the Pedway. Um, and we made this project and we called it the Almighty Church of Abolition. And what we were really trying to do with it is take this point in history where in the 1930s, you had a, um, a European architect by the name of Alphonse Lorencic go and fight against um, uh, Francoism in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Um, and him and uh, his comrades, they, they built these, what they call them psychotechnic torture chambers or checas inside the basement of captured um, churches in Valencia, in, in Barcelona. And um, the idea was to torture Francoists and um, fascists with modern art, right? This is something that then Goebbels, right, the kind of media mind of, of the Nazi party would, um, would, would really pick up on. There's even images of him visiting this later on. Um, and so this is a version of it that I did where I kind of like did my own painting of it. I, I, I do this a lot, you know, I like take images and I really try to like build them up. Um, I think I, I have John Clark to thank for that. Um, a big inspiration uh, to my process in terms of uh, architectural drawings. And um, in, in this one, it was just teasing some of the effects that we wanted to bring here to P11. So the Pedway, if you've been to Chicago, maybe you've been in the Pedway, it's an underground pedestrian walkway, places with really intense climates happen, hot and cold. And so this is a gallery that is run by um, David Hayes from UIUC, as well as uh, Jonathan Solomon from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and uh, about a month and a half ago, Dan Roche and myself spent five days in a basement. That was my vacation, five days in a basement. Then I came to UIUC 
to build this thing for y'all. Um, and so while my family had fun above ground, I was in the belly of the beast of Chicago building this thing. Um, and what we decided to do is kind of like delaminate some of the aesthetics from the kind of prison that that thing was. And as prison abolitionists, we tried to create a kind of space of liberation inside. And so here is an image of Laurentich who was killed at age 37. I am 37. Um, so that was something really special uh, to think about. Um, he was killed for his architecture, just so you know. There were people that were killed for architecture. He's definitely one of them. Um, and so that is not the greatest image. There you go. So we have, the, you know, like we kind of like remove these two huge volumes, put them on top of each other. Um, we, we brought some of the aesthetic effects on the walls and, and brought them up. And then we also use the ceiling as a, um, as, as, as a sort of didactic space, um, as well as the floor as a didactic space. And so what that, that kind of ended up with is this um, sort of playful and open interior to have a party in. And so here you have the kind of graphic design of the tiles that were explaining other projects that were influenced by Laurentich throughout the last 10 years. I am, I'm happy to say that we're the first um, uh, US project on Laurentich. Um, and this, these are projects that happened, one in Toronto and the other one in Barcelona. And then uh, here are, are, are some of the points. So these were another nine points, I like nine points apparently. Uh, for prison abolition that we did um, in this project. And so um, this is, you know, my punctuation to this entire thing is, uh, is this. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just an amplifier. You're an instrument. And uh, we're going to pop that bottle when Kissinger dies. Thank you very much.